All righty. Hey, if you have your Bibles, let's turn uh, to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. Let's stand together as we read. Now, Paul, at this point, he has said, Timothy, you got to keep up the good fight. You've got to do things. You've got to preach the truth. You've got to hold to the truth. And he is letting him now know, Timothy, this is why I have charged you. This is why I have told you this is what you must do. And here is the reason. Let's read this. Here's the reason. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. What is he talking about? His death. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have what? Kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Father, we ask this morning that you would give us wisdom into your word. Lord God, that we would understand uh, the true uh, message of what Paul is saying to us, not just to Timothy, but to those who would come later to read his words. Father, may we be willing to pay attention. May we be willing to allow these words to change us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Paul knows that his death is coming quickly. There is no hiding this fact. He has heard the speech of the guards and those that are in charge. He knows the hate that the religious had for Christ and for anyone who served him. Uh, Paul knew that he would soon die. He understood it. He knew it. He was about to be killed basically because men did not receive the message that he preached, and therefore they made up all types of things, accusations, just as they did against Christ. Paul winds up in prison. And Paul, though while in prison, instead of uh, being one who was unhappy, being one that just let it get to him, he realized that God had given him a place of solitude to write and to, to use that time to encourage the churches where he had been. And Paul understood, God has brought me to this place where I'm about to die in the name of Jesus. And he was at peace. He was at peace. Folks, if you knew how many people I deal with on a regular basis who are not at peace with their own death, you would be frightened for them. People that literally will, will, will wake up at night after having a bad dream, uh, scared that they're going to die. I, I will get a phone call the next day. I, I'm not ready for death. I'm scared. I've talked to people at funerals where a young person has passed and, and all of their friends are there and they're scared of, of, of what's to come. They don't understand death fully. They're not ready for it. Paul was at peace with what was about to happen. Not only was he at peace with his death, but he was at peace because he pretty much knew how he would die. If you and I knew that the executioner's sword would behead us, if we knew that something was going to happen, if we knew that we were going to be hung upside down uh, like Peter was, if we knew that we were going to be burned at the stake, there would be a lot of fear. Paul was not afraid because Paul's death was going to lead to something much greater. As a matter of fact, uh, Romans 12.1 kind of gives us an idea of what uh, Paul was really seeing in death. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Paul is saying, listen, I have lived this life. I am a believer. I am a Christian. I am not like anyone else around me. I have been bought by the blood of Christ. I am different. And as with every breath that I breathe, I will live for Christ. That ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, what is the sacrifice? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, what did they do? They sacrificed live animals. Paul is telling us you should be willing not just to say you're a believer, but if it takes your death 
for what you believe, then so be it. Paul is saying you should be at peace with death if you die in Christ. If you die in the service of the Lord, you have sacrificed, you have done, and that is a holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Like Paul is acting like this should be every believer's life, that you should be willing to die for the sake of Christ. That no matter what happens, your reasonable service is that I will be a sacrifice. I will be different. I will be the one that they can make fun of. I will be the one that they will not want to be around because I'm only going to present Christ. And Paul thought that was just the normal thing for a believer. Think about the early church. They were persecuted and killed for their faith. And I believe that it will eventually become full circle. And the Bible describes it in the end times, there will be those who will have to die for their faith, just as it did in the early church. And I believe that that time is getting close. But Paul was being poured out. He was being poured out. The language that he uses is reminiscent of the Jewish heritage, where we find sacrifices being accompanied with pouring out of a fragrant wine. And in the Old Testament, we find this recorded in Numbers 15, 1 through 7. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you become, when you, when you, uh, become into the land of your habitations, which I give unto you, and will make an offering by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering or a sacrifice in performing a vow or in a freewill offering or in your solemn feast to make a sweet savor unto the Lord of the herd of the flock. Then shall be that offering, his offering unto the Lord, bring a meat offering of a tenth uh, dill of flour mingled with the fourth part of an hen of oil. And the fourth part of an hen of oil uh, or of wine for a drink offering shall thou prepare with the burnt offering or sacrifice for one lamb. Or for a ram, thou shalt prepare for a meat offering, two tenths deals of flour mingled with the third part of an hen oil. And verse 7 says... And for a drink offering, you shall offer the third part of a hen of wine for the sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, those of you who have a different reading, read that last part there. What does it say? What's the last part say? For a sweet savor unto the Lord, what does your Bible say? A pleasing aroma. The King James uses that sweet savor, that thing that would last. That, that, have you ever tasted something? And the moment you tasted it, you're like, man, I could eat that all the time. Those of you that are skinny, you don't understand what I'm saying. (laughs) Okay? For those of you that know what food tastes like, you know what I'm talking about. How many of you have ever had that? Now, I'm serious. I'm I'm, I'm kidding you not. This is my favorite meal, and I think about this meal a lot. Fried venison, mashed potatoes and gravy, big old cat head biscuits. Big old glass of milk. Get out of my way. I am going to be in a food coma before this thing is over with. I'm telling you. I think, seriously, like throughout the day, every now and then, I'll get that taste of that fried venison on my tongue. I'm going, man, that's good stuff. Anybody in here not like fried deer meat? There's the door. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I wouldn't do that to y'all. That's good stuff. How many of you have never had it? You poor people. There's some of y'all. Did y'all eat venison in Puerto Rico? I'll bring you over, brother. You've been in Texas for 20-something years. You've got it figured out by now. Yeah. He wants you to learn to fry venison. Okay. All right. I can see it on him. Here's the thing for us. We should leave such a lasting thing that when it touches the nostrils of God, God says, I want that. I want that. Paul is saying I am being poured out just as a wine on a sacrifice. And as it burns, God smells that and it pleases him. Paul is saying my life above all things needs to please the Lord. When God smells the works of my life, I want it to be something that is a sweet aroma, a savor unto the Lord. Something that he gets and he doesn't want to get rid of. It 
it is important for us to realize that Paul understood he was being poured out. There are a lot of us that don't want to be poured out. We don't want to be changed. We don't want to be challenged. I prayed a prayer, I got baptized, now leave me alone. Folks, that's not salvation. Salvation causes repentance. Repentance causes growth. You and I are called to be poured out. But just as Christ, the Lamb, was sacrificed to remove our sin guilt, so we are called to offer our lives and service as expressions of worship. How can I truly say that I worship God if I am not willing to suffer for the kingdom's sake? If I'm not willing to suffer for Christ's sake? If I'm not willing to suffer in the name of the gospel, how then can I say that I'm a believer? Well, Brother Tom, it's very simple. All you have to do is pray a prayer and get baptized and you are good. No, I'm telling you that you and I have been bought with a price. We have been called to be different. We've been called to be like Paul. Like a lot of us look at Paul and go, man, I wish I could be that person. That's who you're supposed to be. Y'all don't want to amen that because it hurts, doesn't it, to be honest? We look at Paul, man, I wish I could be like Paul. That's who we're supposed to be like. That's the lifestyle we're supposed to be living. God, take me and pour me out. It's an expression of worship. But then we also see Paul's offering was a literal offering of blood, often symbolized as wine, as he gave himself to the executioner's sword. He knew what was going to happen. He knew where he was headed. And you know what he said? God, go ahead and pour me out. I wonder how many of us will be going, I don't deserve this. This is wrong. We would be fighting it. Falsely accused, now we're going to be put to death for those false accusations. I remember when I was a youth pastor and music minister at a little church back in college. There were a whole lot of people who began to get a little frustrated with the way things were going. And so they began to attack me and, and, it, and it came to a point where I lost my job. Man, how I wish I could go back a long time ago, almost 30 years ago. Man, I'm getting old. I didn't realize that, but that's true. Almost 30 years ago. I was 19 years old. Youth and music. Do what? Yeah. You know, here's the thing. Back then, I didn't have the knowledge and wisdom that I know now. And so back then, you know what I tried to do? I tried to defend myself. And I tried to bring nastiness upon those who brought nastiness upon me. But you know what I found out? It was time for me to go anyway. And I got out of there. Paul lied about, abused, stoned, everything. We never see Paul opening his mouth to defend himself. He just simply gave him the word of God. Every time that he would open his mouth, he would bring him gospel. Paul understood all that matters is that they know the gospel of Christ. Pour me out. Talk about me. Be ugly. Whatever. But the most important thing is that you know Christ. How many of us have that testimony that when people are ill against us, we return it with love and grace? Anybody have that testimony? We ought to. Why? Because that's the testimony of Paul. That's the testimony of Christ. That's the testimony of a Christ follower. That when we're reviled, we revile not. How did Jesus go before the slaughter? Anybody remember? Like a a lamb, he was what? Silent. Paul understood, I'm going to die. Timothy You have to understand, my days are numbered. But I want you to know something, Timothy. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul 
Paul's writing his eulogy here. He said, when you stand before the people, let them know this is what I want said. When the news goes out that they have killed me, When the news goes out that I am no longer on this earth, I want them to know that I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now, y'all know how big a deal athletic competitions are today. I mean, right now, people are buying pictures of themselves to be put in a baseball stadium where nobody's sitting. Let me ask you a question. Now, I'm being serious about this. They're like $100 a pop to get your cardboard cut out, whatever, in there, and you're, you're in the, the place. I wonder what we could do with the millions of dollars being spent to glorify yourself in a stadium. I wonder what we could do with those millions of dollars if we were to put them to proper use. I wonder how many people we could feed, how many people we could do things for if we just used it properly, but athletic competitions are a big deal. And folks, they always have been, even in Paul's day. Athletic competitions were huge back in the day. Paul wasn't a foreigner to to what we view today as, as athletes being something. People are like, well, we've made athletes something they're really not. They've always been this way. Why? Because men worship men. That's what we do. It's a shame. But Paul is writing this, and he, the people would know what he's talking about. All of the work, all the discipline, all the training that it would take. Doug, right now, you and Robert, I want y'all to go out, and I want y'all to run from here <laughs> down to uh, the end of Brumlow and back. Could you do it without any problem in 30 minutes? Probably so. Doug? Yes. Jerks. Um, <laughs> No, I knew without a doubt that they could, okay? How old are you, Doug? How old are you? 41 41 and 39. Who else in here in that age bracket feels like they could go down there and back in about 30 minutes? Good. That is awesome. Eric, put your hand down. (laughs) Not in your truck, buddy. (laughs) Running, running, all right? So, George, you feel like you can? Uh, Amy, you feel like you could? That is great. Let me tell you how far I would get. I would get about from from the door. I would hit the street. I could make it further than most of y'all think. I imagine about Eplin's Gate down there. I'm going to need somebody to come and give me some oxygen. I'm going to need somebody to be on in a truck with a bed in the back of the bed of their truck. And I'm going to need you to put me in that thing. And then you can carry me down there and back. And as I'm passing Robert and Doug, I will be waving. (laughs) Athletic feats take a lot of discipline. It takes work to get where you are. Paul is saying, listen, just as an athlete, I have had to train my body for this day. I've had to train my mind for this day. My death is coming, and it brings me joy. Wow. Can you imagine having this thought that my death is going to bring me joy? He's saying all of these men that, that, and women that do all these athletic contests, oh, they have to work hard, but I've had to work hard. And all of my hard work, everything that I have done is for the glory of God. He says, I have fought the good fight. In other words, he has trained himself. He says, I have finished the race. Can I tell you all something? And I I don't mean this to be harsh, but most people never finish the race. They just quit. They barely even get started before they quit. How many of you ever set out to do something great and then when you got started, you realized the cost was too much and so you quit? Paul never left the gospel. He ran with it until the end. He is championing the gospel in his last letter to Timothy. He endured to the end. He never quit. He never gave up. He finished the race. Is that not awesome? 
What a testimony. But Paul concluded, I have kept the faith. This summarized what all the other phrases uh, had described in life and in doctrine. He had stayed the course with integrity. You may tell you how I know this is a struggle for us because when we're around certain people, we're like, I don't want to talk to them about the gospel because if I do, they're not going to like it. You know what you're doing at that point? You're denying the gospel. Sad, but it's the truth. Paul never quit, never gave up. So Paul concluded, I have kept the faith. He stayed the course with integrity. But as Paul awaited for death, he was there on the threshold. He knew it was coming. He knew also what was ahead. You see, what happens, we forget what's next. We forget what's next. Paul understood, I can't get to where I want to be without death. How many of us want to go to heaven? Just raise your hand. Okay? I, I believe that that was 100%. Am I correct? That was 100%. All of us want to go to heaven. Well, guess what? You can't get there without what? Without death. You can't make it to heaven unless you die, unless the Lord comes back. And where do I want to be when the Lord comes back? Y'all all know this story. Where do I want to be? I want to be at the graveyard. I want to be in the cemetery. Because I think it's going to be awesome when those graves open up. Nothing can hold that body down. Boom, they're up. They're gone. And you know what I say at funerals, you're going to be shocked at the graves that open and some that don't open. You're going to be shocked at some that do open and some that don't open. You've got to flip-flop that because you've you got to think about that for a moment. But I'm telling you, Paul is saying, I haven't loved this life anymore. When I became a Christian, I loved heaven more than I loved earth. You want me to tell you what's wrong with our churches today? What do you all think? We love earth more than we love heaven. We love earth more than we love heaven. We we long for payday more than we long for the final payday. Paul knew it was coming. Paul understood this crown of righteousness. It was reward of righteousness. Don't get me wrong. When you are saved, righteousness is imputed into you. But you don't really understand the fullness of righteousness until you die and you are now in the presence of Christ. Paul was saying, listen, just get out of my way. (laughs) What's holding me back from this sword? What's holding me back from this death? Because what is going to happen when I die, I'm leaving this world and I'm going to where I have longed for. Listen to me, young people. You need to start longing for heaven. You need to start longing for heaven more than you long for anything else. Your desire should be to be with the Father. And how do I know that I will be with the Father? When I am found faithful and I'm being poured out as a sacrifice, a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, that's not about your works. That's what happens when the Spirit of God gets a hold of a new believer. They change them. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Paul is saying, listen, I'm dying, but I don't care. Wouldn't that be great to just be able to know that? Man, I'm dying, and I don't care. It is all right with me. So, therefore, we do not lose heart, even though... uh, Our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Here's our problem. Here's where we fail at being like Paul. We're not renewing the inner man day by day. We only renew on Sunday. Folks, if you're only renewed on Sunday, then that's not much salvation. That's not a real salvation. A believer trusts in God 24-7, 365 days a year. Yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. Are you renewing day by day? For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Paul is saying, listen, this jail that they've got me with, these guards that they have me between, all of the stonings that I received, the shipwrecks that I went through, the snake bite that I had, all of those things are just simply light affliction, which is but for a moment. 
And it is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When I stand before the Lord, I'm not going to wear my crown. Y'all ever listen to those new apostolic reformation preachers talk about how they're going to wear their crown? They're going to pray through heaven. What are you going to do with your crown? Somebody tell me. I'm going to lay it down at the feet of Jesus because it don't belong to me. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I don't know about you, but man, heaven's going to be awesome. It's going to be a place where we don't have all the nonsense of this earth. I long for heaven. But you know what? This future doesn't just exist for Paul alone, but also for all who have longed for his appearing, the appearing of Christ. If I'm a believer, what is my greatest joy? (laughs) That this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Isn't that good to know? What's the oldest person that you've ever known personally? Somebody said, mine was 103. Anybody else? What's the oldest person you've ever known personally? 102. 106. All right. Now, think about this for a moment. Why didn't they make it to 104, 107? Why? Because death is sure for all of us. Every one of us, death is coming. We learn through yesterday's experience that we don't know when death is coming, but we can be assured it's coming. And death, by the way, does not miss its date. Did y'all know that? Death does not miss its date. It knows when it's going to strike. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. I can't make it to heaven unless I die. And I should not fear death whatsoever. To close, the question needs to be asked. Are you being poured out? Are you willing to say to God, whatever you desire of me, just pour me out? Whatever has to happen, just pour me out. God, if it hurts, if it means death, if it means affliction, which is but for a moment, pour me out. Paul understood what was coming. And he took it without fear. And he willingly went and said, God, I'll be poured out for you. So many of us, it's on our terms. We want to live life according to how we want to live life. And if we don't get what we want, then we're going to throw a fit. Paul said, God, what I want has nothing to do with this world. I long to be with you. This world is temporary. My best life is yet to come. Amen? My best life is yet to come, and it will be with the Father. Where the Bible describes heaven in this way. No more tears, no more death, no more crying. For the former things have what? Passed away. Isn't that good? Hmm. Father, we thank you for being so good to us. Lord, we praise you for the many, many blessings that you have given us. The blessing of breath, the blessing of a heartbeat, the blessing of another day to share the good news of Jesus Christ with someone who is hurting. Lord God, you have done more
and one day at Calvary than this world could ever do for me in a billion years. You gave me a way to get off of this planet and get out of this world and go to a place that is perfect, to go to a place where there's no more sin, no more temptation. And because of sin, there's death, but not in heaven because there's no more sin, so therefore no more death. No more death means no more sorrow. No more sorrow means no more tears. Father, thank you that we look forward to what you're going to do in the very near future. For some of us, it could be today. For some, it could be tomorrow. Some of us, it could be 50 years from now. But eventually, we will all face death. And I pray that we can face it like Paul. Bring it on. I long to get out of here anyway. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Thank you, Father. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.